thank you so much for being here. Um, that's the way. Um, it really is a, a joy to be here in Lancaster, and it's a joy to be able to talk about William Still um, among people who are so excited to to learn about this. He's a he's a fascinating figure, and I'm I'm really excited to share his story with you tonight and via the book. So, I want to begin tonight the same way that I begin the book. So, if you will, I'd like you to imagine yourself um, in an August evening in 1850. William Still, seen here, this is a, an image of the earliest image we have of William Still um, from the 1850s. So imagine William Still seated at his desk at the anti-slavery office in Philadelphia. A door opened and two men walked in. One of these men Still had seen before he knew him vaguely. The other man was a stranger, a man he had never seen. This stranger introduced himself as Peter Friedman. And he began to tell the story of what had brought him to Still's office in Philadelphia. Friedman, he told Still, had been separated from his parents as a young boy. He and his brother had been sold by their master, first to Kentucky, then to Alabama, where after years of struggle and the death of his brother, Peter had finally been able to purchase his own freedom. Upon doing so, he resolved to head north to find the family that he had lost. Unfortunately, he knew very little about this family. He remembered vaguely that they had lived in a home near the Delaware River, and so this is what brought him to Philadelphia. Now, by this point, Still had developed a reputation as a man who knew how to find people. He was a gatherer of information, um, and so it was unsurprising that Peter came to Still looking for his family. But as he listened to the story, Still was skeptical. He was skeptical not of Peter's story, because it was a story that was quite similar to stories he had heard over and over again. He was skeptical that he was going to be able to help Peter Friedman. Nevertheless, he asked Peter to tell him whatever he, he knew about his family. And so Peter began. My mother, he told, still was named Sydney. My father was named Levin. If still hadn't been paying attention fully, all of a sudden he was at attention. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. His own mother had been named Sydney. His own father had been named Levin. And they had had children separated from them about the time that Peter and his brother would have been separated from their parents. It began to dawn on William Still that the man sitting across from him, the man he had never seen before, was in fact his brother. Now, this is surely among the most exciting, the most monumental moments in Still's life. It was a moment that he would come back to over and over again in telling his own life story. It was, however, no accident. It was not a miracle that Peter Still walked into his brother's office that day. It was instead the product of the work that Still had done, the place he had created for himself at the center of a vast network of abolitionists that by the 1850s was already being called the Underground Railroad. This was a network that spanned, in Still's case, from Georgia to Canada, connecting thousands of activists who were involved in this enterprise of aiding fugitive slaves. And so when we think about this moment, it is not just dramatic, it's not just an exciting moment, but it's a moment that tells us something about Still's life work. This moment is also important, I think, because it tells us, it shows us, it illuminates for us the extent to which Still's work on the Underground Railroad is connected to family. Um, Still is raised in an abolitionist family. His parents had both been enslaved. His mother. Uh, was in fact a fugitive slave. And so he grew up in a family in which the kind of work that he eventually would commit his life to was just something that was a responsibility that he assumed. Um, like so many families, the Still family had been torn apart by slavery, and this informed the work that Still spent his life doing. 
by the early 1850s, still had assumed the role of chair of the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee. Um, you can see some of the, the men associated with the Vigilance Committee here. Do I have a, I'm sure you, down here in the, the corner is the, the image of still that I showed earlier. Um, this is an organization that is committed to protecting fugitive slaves and, and to an extent also free Black people who were often subject to kidnapping in this period and to doing so by any means available to them. This position as chair of the Vigilance Committee involved still in some of the biggest, most consequential events of this era. Um, and I wanna consider a few of these exciting moments just as a way of illuminating certain aspects of Still's work. So the first one I wanna think about is a, a moment involving a man named Henry Brown. So Henry Brown had been enslaved in Richmond, Virginia. His master hired him out to work in a tobacco factory. So in this sense, Brown is quite typical of the urban slavery of this period. Brown was married, but as was also typical of this era, his wife was enslaved to a different master. And so therefore their children were enslaved to this different master. And in 1848, this master decided to sell, to sell Brown's wife and children. Henry Brown would later recall the horror of seeing his wife and children marched down the street in chains. This was the moment when Henry Brown decided to flee, to run away from slavery. There was no longer anything holding him there, so he was ready to take the risk involved in running away. But it is one thing to decide to run away. It is quite another to actually succeed in doing so. Fortunately, Brown concocted an ingenious plan. Working with a white associate named Samuel Smith, he had himself sealed into a crate and mailed from Richmond to Philadelphia. A clever plan for sure, but a plan that would have been inconceivable just a few years earlier when this trip would have taken days. But by the late 1840s, this was a trip that took uh, barely 24 hours but it would be an excruciating 24 hours sealed in this box. At one point, Brown was turned upside down and he was suspended uncomfortably on his shoulder. Despite this, the box arrived in Philadelphia. It was retrieved by an associate of Stills at the depot and brought to the uh, anti-slavery office where you can see Still here in the back, uh, Still and a number of associates gathered around this box anxiously hoping desperately that Brown had survived. They knocked and when Brown uh, responded, they opened the top of the box and out came Henry Brown, forever after known as Henry Box Brown. So Brown understandably was exhausted by this trip. He would spend a few days recuperating in Philadelphia some of that time staying in the still household. And then he was eventually sent on to the North via the same network that still would send hundreds of fugitive slaves on in future years. Um, we see here then that still is not the initiator of this action. Um, it is Brown himself who is the, the driver of the story here. And yet we can see that the network that still has begun to construct in the early 1850s, or by this point is the late 1840s, has already begun to create opportunities for people like Henry Brown to succeed in their efforts. A few years later, a quite a different incident would involve William Still, um, but uh, an incident that would, it would illuminate, uh, once again, some of the most important aspects of his work. So this one might be familiar to some of you here in Lancaster. September 1851, Still received word that there were slave catchers in Philadelphia. Now, this was particularly important news because the year before, Congress had passed a new strengthened fugitive slave law. So in the 1840s, northern states, states like Pennsylvania, had passed a series of laws that we come to call the personal liberty laws that had made it increasingly difficult for slave catchers to come into northern states and recover fugitive slaves. Um, this fugitive slave law now gave slave catchers the power of the federal government to help them in doing their work. 
Uh, this slave catcher or this slave owner in particular was a man named Edward Gorsuch, who had come to Philadelphia seeking a warrant to recover four men. Four men, uh, John Beard, Thomas Wilson, Alexander Scott, Edward Thompson, who had fled his farm and now he understood were living as free men in Christiana. Still received this intelligence and sent it quickly on his Underground Railroad network so that it got to the vigilance, the local vigilance committee in Christiana. So they were prepared when Gorsuch and his slave catching posse arrived. And as a result, they were able to fight off this slave catching posse, enabling these fugitive slaves to escape to Canada. So once again, we see Still's work is very much about intelligence gathering. It's very much about sharing that intelligence. Um, we see, in other words, that the Underground Railroad is about moving information as much as it is about moving people. Which brings us to one last incident, one last dramatic incident that I want to talk about tonight. Um, this, too, reinforces this notion that intelligence gathering is a crucial aspect of Still's work. So once again, he is sitting at his office. This is where Still worked, sitting at an office, wielding a pen. A boy came into his office and placed a note on his desk. It read the following. Sir, will you come down to Bloodgood's Hotel as soon as possible? There are three fugitive slaves here, and they want their liberty. Their master is with them on his way to New York. Now, still knew this hotel. It was near the Walnut Street Pier, and he also knew that if this master indeed was on his way to New York, he would likely take the ferry, the Walnut Street Ferry, across the Delaware River and then catch a train to New York City. Still realized that it was important that they catch this man first before he crossed the Delaware River, before they had to chase him. He hurried then to the hotel, but before he went to the hotel, he met an ally, a man named Passamore Williamson, who was also on the Vigilance Committee with Still. He was the lone white man on the acting committee of the Vigilance Committee. Still realized that having a white man like Passamore Williamson might be valuable in such an instance. When they got to the hotel, they found that the, uh, the woman in question and her master had already left and that they were on the ferry. And so they hurried to the ferry and they hurried to the top deck where they found the woman in question. She was standing there with her two children and next to them was what still described as a sickly looking white man who they assumed was their master. Still and Williamson approached this woman who they later named, learned was named Jane Johnson. They informed her that she was legally entitled to her freedom. Now, Pennsylvania, of course, had begun the process of gradual emancipation years earlier. But when that process was begun, Pennsylvanians had included a provision that allowed masters to bring slaves into Pennsylvania for a period of time. Uh, as long as they didn't overstay this period of time, they could leave and bring their property with them no harm done. Um, but that provision had been repealed. And so when this master brought Jane Johnson willingly onto Pennsylvania soil, as opposed to being a fugitive slave, brought her willingly into Pennsylvania territory, legally, she was free. But as Still and Williamson reminded her, legal freedom did not mean true freedom. Uh, if she left with her master, then it was possible that this moment would be lost. And so they encouraged her to seize this opportunity. And she did. She began walking toward them, at which point her master reached out and grabbed her arm. Suddenly, a group of Black men who had gathered in the area closed in around this master, allowing Jane Johnson to escape, still led her down the stairs into the street where they boarded a carriage and still spirited her off into the streets of Philadelphia, hiding her overnight in his home and then sending her north, first to New York and then further on to New England. Now, it turned out this master was quite an important person. Uh, his name was John Wheeler, and he was, in fact, the U.S. minister to Nicaragua. Now, this was a particularly important position at this moment because in the 1850s, 
many slave-owning Southerners had begun to eye the Caribbean and Central America greedily. Some of them had ambitions to actually seize this territory. Others wanted to be sure that these new nations, many of whom had abolished slavery, were at the very least safe for slavery. And so this role of minister to Nicaragua was very much on the mind of slaveholders in this moment. Um, in fact, this man, John Wheeler, had dined with the president the night before in the White House. So a very connected man. And John Wheeler, of course, used his connections first to try to recover his property. Um, but as that appeared unlikely, at the very least, he wanted to make sure that the men responsible for stealing his property from him, including William Still, were prosecuted. Eventually, these men were accused of assault and battery. The claim was that they had seized this woman and torn her away from Wheeler. Of course, uh, Wheeler argued Jane Johnson wouldn't have freely chosen to leave slavery. Um, eventually, Still and these other men were acquitted. Um, and most importantly, Jane Johnson and her sons were never returned to bondage. We see, therefore, in this Jane Johnson incident, uh, again, the collection of information as a crucial aspect of William Still's work. We see a kind of savvy exploitation of the conflict between federal and state law. And most crucially, we see Still building upon the support of Black Philadelphians. Um, this sort of community support of Still's Underground Railroad work is absolutely essential to its success. So as important as all these dramatic events were, they don't tell the whole story, right? If we think about our own lives. Our lives are not made up simply of the most dramatic events in our lives. And so I think to understand William Still and his true importance, we also need to look beyond these dramatic moments and look at his day-to-day -day work. This seemingly mundane work he did on a daily basis isn't as exciting as challenging John Wheeler on a ferry boat or sending word to Christiana rebels, but nevertheless, it was an essential part of Still's ability to help perhaps a thousand fugitive slaves escape during the 1850s. Still was, to put it simply, a connector. Communication and coordination were the key to his work. As I said earlier, he did this work with a pen sitting at a desk. He had connections near and far. Nearby, he had connections with men like Thomas Garrett in Wilmington, Delaware. Um, these nearby connections were important for Still because they helped funnel fugitive slaves toward him in Philadelphia. It was important that he be in communication with these men because once a fugitive slave arrived in Philadelphia, he was no, he was not safe, right? That, that fugitive slave was at great risk in Philadelphia until he or she made contact with someone like Still or someone who could help them move on to the next step. Um, he also had connections here in Lancaster. So um, some of his crucial allies in this area operated in Columbia, which had long been a refuge for fugitive slaves from Maryland. Here, the key figures are uh, William Whipper, seen here, and Stephen Smith, who were black lumber merchants in this area. Um, Whipper would later recall sending hundreds of fugitive slaves on their way, some of them west towards Pittsburgh, but many of them east towards William Still in Philadelphia. Um, many of these fugitive slaves, in fact, rode aboard the same freight cars that were carrying the lumber from Whipper and Smith's lumber business. Still also had connections at Harrisburg. In Harrisburg, the key figure was a man named Joseph Bustle, who was a black school teacher born in Philadelphia, but settled in Harrisburg, who had helped establish what was called the Fugitive Aid Society, essentially a Harrisburg um, version of Still's Vigilance Committee. In his correspondence, the extensive correspondence with Still, he speaks of sending, quote, packages on their way via the Reading Railroad. Still also had connections with ship captains who sailed in and out of southern ports, and uh, some of whom 
were willing to smuggle fugitive slaves aboard their ships, ships that sailed out of places like Wilmington, North Carolina, Norfolk, Virginia, et cetera. This policy or this practice of smuggling fugitive slaves aboard ships was common enough that North Carolina instituted what was known as the policy of smoking ships before they left port. That was, they in infused these ships with noxious smoke that was intended to drive secreted fugitive slaves out of their hiding places. Others attempted to replicate Henry Box Brown's method of sealing themselves in a box and mailing themselves north. Some of them succeeded and some of them didn't. Others just arrived in Philadelphia. Some of them uh, were brought to Still by associates. Others simply showed up at his home or at his office. Many of these fugitive slaves would find shelter with Still before moving on. Still would often provide them with medical care and food. Sometimes he provided them with a bath and a haircut. Many of them had been on the road for days, weeks, and in order to take the next step on. So many of these individuals would ride trains. They needed to blend in. Um, having a, a new set of clothes, having a, a shave and a haircut was an essential part of making them blend in and helping them make this next step. Still in the Vigilance Committee provided money, train tickets, and connections to New York City and beyond. They often went to New York for the same reason they came to Philadelphia. It was a transportation hub. Um, but New York was no safer for them than Philadelphia. And so it was really important that when they arrived in New York, still had made a connection with his allies there so that they were prepared to, uh, to, to take over at that point. All of this, of course, cost money. And a big part of Still's job was raising that money. He would, he and the Vigilance Committee hosted local meetings, often in black churches, where people would uh, contribute money to the cause. Agents for the, uh, for the Vigilance Committee traveled to Great Britain. So a significant portion of the funds that enabled Still to do his work came from British abolitionists. He also, and this is what we see here, he kept careful records of his expenditures. So these records accomplished a few things. So um, first off, they enabled still to demonstrate that he was using the money that was entrusted to him for the cause for which it was entrusted. Uh, there were often accusations, not just leveled against Still, but leveled against all sorts of people involved in this sorts of work, that they were somehow misappropriating this money. And it was really important for Still, if he wanted to continue to raise this money, to be able to demonstrate that he was spending this money efficiently. Um, he also kept these records for a more personal reason. So I began today with this story of the reconciliation between William Still and his brother, Peter. Still hoped that these records would enable other such reconciliations. So often fleeing slavery meant leaving family behind. Years later, it was hoped that, that some of these family members would be able to recover these connections, these family connections that had been lost. As I've alluded to earlier, Still's work also involved intelligence gathering to a significant extent. This happened in a number of ways as well. So on a daily basis, Still read Southern newspapers, <laughs> newspapers from Richmond, newspapers from Baltimore that were delivered to the anti-slavery office. Um, these newspapers included runaway slave ads. So they were placed for the purpose of recovering those fugitive slaves, Still turned these purposes on their head. Um, many of these ads will indicate that a particular fugitive slave is likely to have gone here or there. If Still knew that they were likely headed to Philadelphia, he was prepared. He was on the lookout for these individuals. He also, of course, had informants. So that boy who brought the note to him uh, in the case of Jane Johnson, he also had inside connections in the police office. So the, the police Police officers were often involved as slave catchers. Not all police police officers were sympathetic to the catching of fugitive slaves. Some of them would share information with Still 
Um, in the case of uh, Christiana, there was also inside information in the, the slave commissioner's office that sent this to William Still. So he has this, this network of informants that are helping him do his job. As you can imagine, this work that Still was doing in the 1850s, this, this underground railroad work, not only dominated his professional life, but it spilled over into his personal life. There was very little division between Still's home life and his work life. Um, once again, he was raised in an abolitionist household and an abolitionist family, and he ran an abolitionist family. Um, Sometimes he would find other places for fugitive slaves to hide while they remained in Philadelphia, but quite often they stayed in the still home. Eventually, Still and his wife would run a boarding house, which would enable them to protect even more fugitive slaves in this manner. This, of course, meant that Still's wife, Letitia Still, played a critical role in his Underground Railroad work. This is a role, however, that is sometimes difficult to get at. Um, Still's work is very well documented. Letitia's is sometimes, and this is often the nature of women's work in this period, is often not as well documented. But the best evidence we have for the crucial role that Letitia was playing in this Underground Railroad work were the letters that were written to Still by refugees he had helped along the way. Over and over, these letters mention Letitia Still. They ask about her. They recall her. They want to be remembered to her. They talk about the Still children who were quite young at this time. Recall, once again, that many of these fugitive slaves had left their own families behind. And so we can imagine how meaningful this was for them, even for a moment, even for just a night uh, of refuge in the Still household, to be surrounded by this loving Still family clearly had an impact on these fugitives from slavery. So Still's work on the Underground Railroad would also lead him to take on a, a bigger role outside of this particular aspect of the abolitionist movement. So he became a leading Black abolitionist in Philadelphia in other respects as well. Now, this runs counter to what we think we know about the Underground Railroad. It certainly runs counter to what I thought I knew about the Underground Railroad before I started working on this book. We imagine that it's this secretive work that can't, you know, no one can know about it, but this isn't true at all. Still actually was publicly known as the leader of the Underground Railroad in Philadelphia. Um, and as this public face of the Underground Railroad, he became public in other ways as well. We see him um, leading a protest against the Fugitive Slave Law in 1850 on the public stand, making speeches against it. We see still writing letters to newspapers, weighing in on the important issues of the day. For example, the rise of the anti-slavery Republican Party, uh, denouncing the Dred Scott decision. Uh, these are things that Still is writing about, that he's engaged in the kind of public protest against the Dred Scott decision. He also became a prominent advocate for the expansion of Black citizenship rights. Abolitionists like Still were not content simply to fight against slavery. They wanted to ensure that African Americans were granted all the rights of citizenship that they felt they were deserved. One of the notable crusades that still became involved in in the 1850s was the fight for desegregating the streetcars of Philadelphia. Now, Philadelphia, like all the cities of this era, was growing dramatically. And as Philadelphia grew beyond the, the confines of the early city laid out by William Penn, it was no longer a walking city, but it was a city that you needed to have some form of transportation to traverse. Um, initially, this had been, you know, horses. Uh, there were omnibuses that were pulled by horses. By the 1850s, Philadelphia had a network of what were known as streetcars, still pulled by horses, but laid along or running along tracks. And so they were smoother, they were faster, more comfortable, and somewhat less expensive, which meant that they were open to more and more people. However, they were segregated. Black Philadelphians could ride the streetcars, but they had to ride on the, uh, the platform on the outside. They couldn't ride on the inside with white patrons. Um, 
So still became involved in the fight against this. Uh, he wrote a letter, you know, he, he wrote letters to the newspaper protesting this practice. He eventually would establish organizations that would build opposition, uh, which culminated in the state legislation, which outlawed the practice of segregation in streetcars in 1867. Still would also be an advocate for Black voting rights. So in 1838, Pennsylvania adopted a new constitution, which explicitly disenfranchised Black men, and so still was pushing against this practice. Um, he also became a, an advocate for Black economic progress, so he recognized that political and social equality would not be, uh, you could not be achieved without economic progress. Uh, black Northerners were typically closed out of good paying jobs, and so uh, he became involved in, in sort of a push for Black economic independence. He saw himself in this regard as an exemplar of the path that Black African-American uh, Philadelphians could take in this regard. He would eventually become a successful businessman, coal dealer, um, an advocate for respectability and self-help and Black uplift. He also, of course, supported education, which he saw as a critical part of this fight for Black uplift. For all this work, though, he never lost sight of the importance of the Underground Railroad, underground railroad in his life. Even as he was aiding fugitive slaves in the 1850s, he was publishing stories in the newspaper about the Underground Railroad. Again, this runs counter to this kind of notion that this is this secretive endeavor that nobody knows about and no one can talk about. Still was talking about it in the newspapers in the 1850s. Now, he couldn't tell everything, right? He had to leave out lots of details because he didn't want to give away lots of his secrets. Um, nevertheless, he was celebrating this act of helping fugitive slaves and his own role in doing so in the 1850s publicly. Why would he do this? Why? I mean, was it just pure braggadocio? Um, no. I mean, there was very much a reason behind this strategy. So the first most important reason probably, again, is associated with what we see here, still was raising money. It was easier to raise money to do this thing if people knew about what you were doing. Um, publicizing these stories became essentially propaganda to help raise funds for the Vigilance Committee. Another reason I think that these stories played an important part for Still in his public activism was we should recall that the 1850s are dark days for abolitionists. Um, lots of things aren't going their way in the 1850s. In lots of ways, slaveholders, the so-called slave power, seems to be in ascendant. And in these darkest of days, I think still felt it was encouraging for abolitionists to be able to look at the Underground Railroad and see a success story, to see that despite all of these things, despite terrible things happening in Kansas, despite the Dred Scott decision, um, they were helping. They were winning this fight in very specific ways. After the Civil War, Still would increasingly be called upon to tell these stories publicly. He became a kind of official uh, historian of the Underground Railroad, but Still, of course, wanted to get these stories right. Um, already, there had begun to be a kind of tendency to tell the stories of the Underground Railroad as a story of white benevolence, a story about heroic white figures who played the most important role in this and helped the kind of uh, helpless fugitive slaves along the way. Now, Still was never one to slight his white allies. He readily accepted and celebrated the role that white allies had played in the work that he did on the Underground Railroad, but he knew that was not the whole story. And in fact, to Still, that wasn't even the most important part of the story. And so in telling his story of the Underground Railroad, he wanted to make sure that the contributions of the Black community in places like Christiana, in places like Columbia, in places like Philadelphia was known. Most importantly, still wanted to be sure 
that fugitive slaves were not seen as helpless beneficiaries. He emphasized that fugitive slaves were key contributors in their own liberation to adopt for a moment this language of the Underground Railroad still argued that these fugitive slaves were agents in their own flight to freedom. The fruit of this, these years of Underground Railroad storytelling for Still would be, as already mentioned, his monumental book, The Underground Railroad. Uh, nearly 800 pages of stories, biographies, letters, newspaper excerpts. It's a sort of catch-all of things that Still had collected over his years of activism. Through this 800 pages of text, Still tells us a remarkable story of collective struggle. It is not to still the story of an exceptional few, but instead the story of hundreds of remarkable individuals who, despite the significant barriers placed before them, were able to seize the opportunities presented to them and make their way to freedom. It was, for still, essentially a demonstration of the capacity and ability of Black men and women to seize this opportunity. And, and we cannot Remember, at this moment, this is a particularly contentious and important argument for still to be making. This is the moment of Reconstruction, where um, even many of the white Northerners who had supported the anti-slavery movement were beginning to have second thoughts about the Reconstruction of the South. So at this moment, to make this argument for Black success, for Black excellence, uh, is a really politically resonant moment. The book is also a fitting encapsulation of Still's life work. Still's story then, both the book that he published about the Underground Railroad and the story of his life that I've attempted to tell in this book and that I've attempted to, to give you a sense of tonight, is not the story of a single lone individual. It is instead the story of how one remarkable man contributed to a collective struggle, a collective struggle that still always understood was larger than himself. Thank you. All right. Now, now, there we go. Okay. If anybody has questions, we have some time for questions. So we've got a whole bunch of questions. So, um, does that thing fit right in? Thank you. Uh, fascinating. I have two questions. I don't think they're related. I'm just curious which newspapers in Philadelphia accepted and published Still's letters because they were certainly factions expressed among mm -hmm. the newspapers. Um, and I'm also curious if Still himself was ever threatened with violence, kidnapping, and uh, you can imagine. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, thank you. So, still use different newspapers for different purposes. So, um, you know, he had a long standing, uh, and not always just in Philadelphia. So, he had a long standing connection with Marianne Shad Carey, who published the Pennsylvania, or the, excuse me, the Provincial Freeman in Canada among refugees, uh, many of whom still had helped along the way. Um, you can find Still's writing in other Black newspapers, Frederick Douglass's multiple uh, newspapers. When it came time for still to begin attacking the segregation of streetcars, however, he didn't write in the abolitionist press. He actually wrote in the, the Pennsylvania North American, I can't, you know, sometimes these, these titles change, the North American, which was a kind of, um, you know, ostensibly Republican newspaper, but certainly not an abolitionist newspaper, a, a, you know, a newspaper of the business class. And I think still really felt like that was the class he was trying to speak to. So again, it would vary depending on, on what he was trying to accomplish. As for was still threatened with physical violence, um, not generally, you know, so I think this moment with Jane Johnson is probably the moment where physically he is the most uh, under threat. Um, you know, still is, he's, uh, he's doing his work with a pen. Uh, certainly what he's doing is illegal, 
but it doesn't seem that still was sort of constantly being bullied by slave catchers the way we might imagine. Saw another question over here. Would you be able to tell this story in Florida where the governor doesn't look on certain <laughs> periods of history? Well, he was in uh, Philadelphia just the other day, so we could have, maybe, he's, is he here? I don't know. Did he make, well, I think, um, you know, I think Still's work or his life story works on multiple levels. I think that's what I tried to do in this book. I think there are lots of levels to this story. Um, I think that there are, there are levels on which this is a story that's unaccept, uh, unobjectionable to just about anybody. It's a story of, of a self-made man. It's a story, um, but I think, you know, I don't know. <laughs> you have to ask him, I guess. Thank you. Do we know where he is buried and does he have any living descendants? Oh my goodness. Does he have living descendants? Um, the Still family is enormous. So so we do know where he's buried, Eden Cemetery. Um, the Still family is huge. So he's one of um, 18, you know, it's, it's somewhat disputed, but huge family, possibly 18 siblings. Um, lots of still descendants are alive. And there's a huge family reunion every year in South Jersey. Um, uh, I'm told by, yeah, so so definitely huge still presence. And the still family are critical caretakers of still story. So um, fortunately, I have a, I had a still descendant who was willing to read the manuscript before it was published. So he helped catch a couple of things that um, I'm glad I didn't make it into the book, but yeah, so there's a there's a still family out there doing important work. and and i I guess that's an opportunity for me to say, um, you know, we talk about these uncovering these stories of these these people who aren't uh, who aren't given the the recognition they deserve. That's often a case of we're not listening to the right people. You know, people have been telling still story. We haven't necessarily been listening for it. I'll walk across the room while I read some Zoom questions. Um, one came in from online. Where did Still keep his records safe? So this is a great question because, um, you know, for much of the 1850s, he didn't seem to make any special effort to hide them in a secret compartment. But in 1859, Still was implicated, you know, I didn't talk about all. So you have to read the book to find all the exciting stuff about it. He was implicated in John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. So still had had met with John Brown, um, had been part of the planning, though still seems to have been skeptical of the, the effectiveness of still of uh, John Brown's plan. But when John Brown and his allies are captured, one of Brown's lieutenants has contact information for still in his pocket. Um, so still all of a sudden realized that he might be under threat. And so he hid his records in uh, a building that was connected to a black cemetery. So, so it was that, that was the point where he had to hide his records. Thank you for writing this book. I can't wait to read it. Um, question for you, to what extent was he um, involved with local Philadelphia and state politicians? Did he have any interaction with Thaddeus Stevens or um, everyone knew what he was really doing? Mm -hmm. um, you haven't mentioned anything about that. I'm just curious. Yeah. So um, this is a question that comes up a little bit later in the book. So, you know, the 1850s still certainly is not does not have connections with with anyone in elected politics. Um, you know, in the 1860s, as he becomes involved in the push especially to legislatively deal with segregation in, in Pennsylvania, he does begin to cultivate connections with political leaders, most often outside of Philadelphia. So the, the Republicans in Philadelphia are the ones who are most hostile to the desegregation of streetcars. Um, but I would say, you know, in comparison to some, some other figures of this era, so, you know, in Philadelphia, you know, Octavius Caddo is, is the kind of person who's operating in the same vein here, Caddo is much more connected politically than Still is. Still is always, um, he comes out of this tradition, this abolitionist tradition of kind of skepticism towards electoral politics, um, which doesn't mean that he doesn't favor the Republican Party, um, but he's always skeptical of the motivations of politicians. And so when it comes down to it, that's not really the way that Still, for the most part, is pursuing his activism. But certainly in this particular campaign to desegregate the streetcars, he does have connections to politicians. He's writing letters, he's, he's lobbying politicians. 
I'm going to ask another Zoom question. I'm going to reframe it ever so slightly. Um, taking into consideration the population of Philadelphia, including the Quaker populace, do you think Williams still would have been able to have the same degree of activity in another location like New York City? Ah, the, the dreaded historical counterfactual. Um, I, you know, the way I would approach this question is to say that the nature of still still is is very much a creature of his time and place. Um, he operates in the way that he does because of where he is situated. He takes advantage of what I think is the changing attitudes of Philadelphia in this moment. In part, it's because Black Philadelphians are more assertive, are standing up for themselves. It's a safer place to do this kind of work than it would have been in the 30s and 40s. And Philadelphia was notorious as a place where Black communities were under assault, Black churches were being burned, etc. In the 1850s, you know, still is operating publicly. And, and instead, we see Black crowds gathering outside of the courthouse as a kind of implicit threat of people who are being sent back to slavery, right? So, so things have changed in Philadelphia. Um, would he have done the same work in New York? I mean, there were people doing similar work in New York. So I think uh, had he been there, I think he would have done similar kind of work. But I think certainly it's it's a particular story about how Still seizes this moment in this place and does the important work uh, of that place. Okay, I'm going to combine two questions into one as I walk back toward Mabel. Um, one comes from my neighbor, Moira Jean, so I can um, tell her in answer to her question. Uh, her question is, how did, how did Still achieve its freedom? I think our sound is you know, giving us trouble. How did Still achieve his freedom before his brother? And rather than letting Andrew answer that question, I'm actually going to lead into the next one, which is that you should read his book to find out. <laughs> and buy it here. And then I'll go to the next question, which is, do you have any other books aside from your own, which is excellent. You should all read it. It's incredibly um, contextual. It gives great detail about the Underground Railroad, not just William Still. That said. In addition to your own book, do you have other resources about the Underground Railroad you would recommend? So this is, I mean, there are there are too many to even mention, but I think um, if we want to think about, if you're interested in the Underground Railroad and you want to look at a, a book that's going to give you a bigger picture of, you know, so still story I think is really important and, and I hopefully illustrate how his small story is connected to this much larger regional and national network. I think a book that is really wonderful and readable and fascinating and gives you the bigger picture of the Underground Railroad is for, uh, he was already mentioned because he's going to be, he's going to be at the, um, the, the oratorio next week, Fergus Bordewich. Uh, he wrote a book called Bound for Freedom. I think that's what it's called, Bound for Bound Freedom. For Canaan. Bound for Canaan, uh, which is really great. Um, so I, I would definitely steer you towards that. Um, you know, I, I love, um, you know, a particular figure who I haven't talked about, but was, it's, it's always amazing. I've done this talk a number of times and I always forget to talk about Harriet Tubman. Um, so Tubman was an ally of Still. Um, you know, Catherine Clinton has written a wonderful biography uh, that I love of Harriet Tubman. So that would be a good place to go as well. 